Hello everyone, a warm welcome and thank you for joining us today to learn more about the creation of Europe's first smart canal with Scottish canals. My name is Ben Hutchins and I'm part of the marketing team here at Innovise. Before I introduce our presenters, if you have any questions today, please type them into the question box located in the right corner of your GoToWebinar interface. We will not mention your full name when reading your questions and our experts will provide answers. Please note that all phone lines are muted during the webinar today. Now let me introduce you to your experts. Firstly, we are proud to welcome as our special guest, Peter Robinson, Head of Engineering at Scottish Canals. Peter is a Chartered Engineer and Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers. His career has included work in flood risk and surface water management for 25 years, delivering schemes across Scotland, the UK and the Middle East. Previously to joining Scottish Canals, Peter was a director at ACOM, leading the water business in Scotland where he created the concept for the North Glasgow Integrated Water Management System, where he is now responsible for operations. Peter and his wife also spent two years sailing around the world, including passing through the Panama Canal, which turned out to be his first taste of canal engineering. Joining Peter Robinson is Peter Coombs, Innovation Manager at Innovise. He is a chart of water and environment manager with 44 years of experience covering all aspects of storm and foul water drainage. He designed, modelled and delivered a range of projects in the UK before moving to the Middle East for five years. For the past 19 years, Peter has been with the Innovise group specialising in water supply, suds design, wastewater hydraulic modelling, flood modelling, asset management and artificial intelligence across the EMEA region. That completes our expert lineup for you today. So let's start the show. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Ben, and uh, welcome everyone. And and thanks for joining us, Peter. P Peter Robinson. This is going to be confusing, isn't it? They have P Peter Robinson would be Peter Wood, and I'll be Peter too today. Um, but I've known Peter for many years. Uh, we first. Uh, met, uh, if I remember rightly, Peter, we were at, the, at a conference, SEDS conference up in Glasgow and um, presenting there and very much uh, of, of like minds. And I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, present on your North Glasgow Integrated Water Management System. I've seen a presentation on, on this and we've been actively involved in supporting the whole project. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like to just hand over to yourself and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, enjoying the presentation. Over to you, Peter. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter, too. Yeah, this is going to be quite entertaining. We'll, we'll try and keep it clear. Um, lovely. Um, and thank you for certainly for the opportunity of coming and presenting today um, uh, as, as InnoVise as an organization. And uh, yeah, you're reflecting on my career, I think, of, of opening up bits of software many, many years ago, microdrange and the other bits of pieces. It's been a, a great journey and, and experience. Um, my, my career through from consultancy, you know, engineering to um, effectively in a client role and, and um, you know, having an operational responsibility for a system that we've, we've now built. So um, today I want to, I'm going to take you through, um, effectively I refer to it quite often as, as a 10-year a journey working through looking at uh, opportunities and, and, and different thinking to actually then now realizing and delivering something on site. Um, I'm going to talk more about the why. Uh, a little bit of reflection on the what and, and how, because obviously I know it will be a very technical community, but you probably, m many people will understand this as well as or even possibly even better than I do. So it's really going to be more about the why, because there's, there's a really strong um, purpose for, for the system. Um, I refer to this as my third child. Um, my wife would tell you that I put more effort into this one than the other two. Um, it has been quite, uh, quite a journey. And... Um, part of it is just the number of people and organizations and suppliers and everybody getting involved all the way through um, across the whole industry and the whole community. Um, without them, this wouldn't have been realized. So there's a little bit of thank you and, and, and hopefully you can have an insight for those listening, taking away um, some elements of this and hopefully being able to learn lessons and take the benefits and speed up some of the processes and realize that actually doing things like this can be done and um, does make a difference. So. Uh, hopefully 40 minutes 45 minutes maybe and then we can have some time for, for a discussion at the end um so a uh, little bit of slides um the north glasgow integrated water management system i remember giving it a name it's an acronym that doesn't come off the, the tongue very quickly so we kind of branded it glasgow smart canal um it's it's more than just the canal it, it's the canal and it's the surface water management system and it's the development that then wraps around it um and actually we are now looking at changing Glasgow Smart Canal into Scotland Smart Canal as we build more technical in, in, innovations and bringing them into the same um, platform. So it, it's a great hub and something that we're going to build and expand upon 
um, and, and continue to innovate and change what we have as, a, as an organization. Um, just to touch upon, and it would be uh, uh, remiss of me to not recognize a number of the different people that have been involved from um, the, the project being realized under the Metropolitan Glasgow Strategic Drainage Partnership, which um, was formed uh, following serious flooding that took place in Glasgow um, in the early noughties. Um, and the Scottish Canal has been part of that. The, the City Council, key to it. Scottish Water, again, part of that. Um, and we were really lucky through the, the journey of the project to be able to achieve funding that came from a variety of sources to be able to pay for the scheme. Um, the, the benefits are multiple benefits. The, the, the beneficiaries are multiple um, and the contributors. And then at the bottom of it, a whole range of people supplying information, data, um, actually, she mentioned super involved in that. And yes, we've got Innovise, some of the technical aspects, the Met Office feeding data in, ACOM, where I, where I worked as the, as the designers with Biomatrix, McKenzie's being uh, the contractors and Fairfields um, delivering this as a, as a project. And when I look back, you know, it's, it's amazing how all of these organizations and the individuals within those organizations have contributed and played their part. Um, and it, it definitely is a big bit of teamwork um, to make something like this happen. Um, a little bit just for me to touch upon and give you a, a con context of Scottish canals and who we are. Um, we have effectively five canals across Scotland. Um, the fourth and Clyde that we're going to touch upon today was the first sea to sea canal in the world um, and it opened in 1790. Um, we have 43 scheduled monuments within our remit. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with old historic infrastructure and I'll touch upon some of the purpose to give you a little bit of background. Um, you know, we manage reservoirs, aqueducts, um, 140 miles of canals, 90 lock chambers. All of these, some of them are, are interacting within this system. Um, I worry about one giant wheel, which is the Falkirk wheel. I've got two horses' heads, which are the Kelpies. Um, as, I, as, as some people who follow me on LinkedIn, you know, hashtag never a dull moment. There is never a dull moment at Scottish Canals. Um, we, you know, we do weird and wonderful things. We have, you know, 20, 20 million visitors a year come to our canals, and that's part of our purpose. We are the custodians of the canals in the 21st century. Um, my career is now part of their lifespan, whereas actually quite often projects are just part of people's careers. And you have to put that into the context and recognize your, your part to play. Um, so a little bit for today, uh, I'm going to try and I appreciate there's people who might not understand the geography. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the geography of where we are. Um, try and explain to you why we've done what we've done. Um, my wife always says, always start with a why, and it's always really useful. Talk about the concept and how we've created the concept, explain and give you an update on where we are on the delivery. And I want to give you an insight as to where this is and the springboard it's giving us to the future and where we sit and actually where a lot of organizations and asset owners um, will probably start reflecting on where they sit um, today in the 21st century. So before we start to get some terminology right, because this confuses people sometimes, so um, I might refer to feeders, which uh, effectively are the channels on the watercourses that feed the canal with water. So, um, you know, we, we have to put water in every time boats move about, water flows uh, around the canal. Nothing is pumped, everything is done by gravity. Um, I might refer to waste weirs, and that's really important. This is not waste water. Uh, we refer to waste weirs because the water is a resource and it's being wasted if it leaves the canal network. Um, when I say waste weirs and people think, oh my gosh, and they think of sewage and other bits and pieces, and I'm sure some of you will be working in wastewater uh, aspects and projects. The summit pound is the highest point of the canal network. So the bit in the summit pound that I refer to, the water flows from that east and west, um, and, and we are operating within the summit pound. We're operating the highest part of the Forth and Clyde canal network. Uh, dynamic, if I talk about dynamic, I'm referring to autonomous control, autonomous um, operation. And I was, I was speaking to Peter and Ben earlier about doing a, a presentation previously to canal engineers. And when I mentioned autonomous um, controls, I got a slightly different response than I was expecting because um, canals and autonomous, so 18th century meets 21st century, a bit of nervousness kicking around that. And again, if I mention it's water sensitive urban design, um, when the concept was being developed back in 2012, 2013, I was fortunate enough to be working with Syria um, and we were developing the UK uh, with sort of guidelines at the time. And that actually was really powerful for me personally because it helped inform a lot of the thinking that I was, I was able to apply at the time. Um, and I would recommend you go and have a look at it if you haven't previously. So a little bit of the geography. Um, 
I've updated this just because I thought, crikey, the, the maps need to be taken out because I'm sure there's more people from further and further afield starting to take notice of, of what we're doing. Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, you know, this, this is the central belt of Scotland. Um, that we've got um, two, two canals, one that goes, uh, the Fort and Clyde, which goes from east to west, uh, or west to east, uh, which is um, the, the, the main blue line going from bowling on the Clyde all the way across to Grangemouth and Fal well, Falkirk and then Grangemouth uh, in the east. And then we have the Union Canal, which goes from Falkirk uh, at the top of the Falkirk wheel and goes all the way into Edinburgh. The Fort and Clyde being the, um, the first sea to sea canal that opened in 1790, uh, the Union Canal flows, uh, goes all the way into Edinburgh, it's a contour canal, it's 51 kilometers long um, and it's perfectly flat. Um, I refer to it as the world's longest spirit level. Mm. Except when the wind blows and we find that the water at one end is slightly higher than the other. Um, and actually we find that the water level on the Forth and Clyde is slightly higher in the east than the west and it's not to do with tide, it's just to do with prevailing weather, with weather conditions. Um, and that the summit pound is 19 kilometers long. So it, it's a significant body of water. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on Glasgow and North Glasgow, because obviously that's where the, the, the project is. But the geography, and, and I'll, you'll see some of the bits and pieces in the geography later on, because the system is really broad. Um, we can actually drain water around the canal network kilometers uh, and, and, and mega gallons of water per day by gravity. Um, and actually, that's a testament to the engineers that preceded us and what they've left us. It's absolutely phenomenal as a piece of infrastructure uh, and what it's capable of doing. And that's certainly a potential that we're trying to unlock now and bring to make 21st century relevant. A little bit of history, North Glasgow. This is a slightly old map of, of North Glasgow and, and um, in preparing and thinking about some of these things and messages was quite interesting. And, and we refer to you know the circular economy and, and where we are. And, and that, there's a little bit around this about why the canals were built. So. Back in the day, if you take getting the TARDIS and go and go way, way back, the canal when it was built was literally built through countryside. There was there was you know very little development sitting there, and it was built to support and drive the industrial revolution. Um, so um, effectively, it, it brought timber into the city of Glasgow to enable the city to be built, um, and it came along the canal. Um, and and we see timber yards and timber basins um, right in the middle of Glasgow. The history is still there. You can you can find it if you go looking for it. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a timber basin, and, and actually that's part of the nature reserve that we've rebuilt. Um, whiskey, always really important in Scotland to have whiskey close to your population. And, and until, seven, until 1910, the largest whiskey distillery in the world was located in North Glasgow, right next to the canal. And, the, you know, the grain was brought into to the distillery along the canal, and then it was taken off and, and basically put into the distillery, uh, created, make the whiskey, to um, let's say fuel the population of the city. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, and when you think about circular economy, the the, the draft from the whiskey and the, from the distillery was basically taken up the hill uh, to cow lairs, where effectively that's where the cows for the city were kept, and they fed the cows to create the milk to take down and feed the bairns of the city. So. Now the adults were getting the whiskey and, and through a circular economy approach, you know, minimum footprint, minimum carbon footprint, the milk was, was produced locally and taken down to, to grow the city. And then finally, um, at the end of the canal, or the end of the canal as it is today, the, the power station was built and the coal was brought into the city and that's where the electricity was produced, which effectively enabled the city to grow. And, I, and if you look at Glasgow and the history of Glasgow and how it's developed over time, the canal historically was key to its development. Um, the city centre certainly, because because the, the shipbuilding is further away. Um, and if you look back, Go Govan, um, uh, where the shipbuilding was, was actually bigger than Glasgow. And, and there must have been a fight at some some point about who got the, the regional name. And it was because the city grew, and it, it grew on um, it grew on exports and imports, and and grew, and, 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 the, and the industrial growth, um, and a lot of t tobacco and other industries. And and we were, we're left with a huge legacy of architectural, you know, the buildings and the, and the city layout and the development. And it's quite strange thinking about this and, you know, and, and technology and where we are in the 21st century and bring it to play, but it is about circular economy and, and sustainability and minimizing our footprint. And here we are in the 21st century constantly talking about circular economies. And yeah, actually, if we just wind the clock back 200 years, we had a circular economy uh, and there is an element of, of is there an opportunity of going back? And, and that has informed some of the bits and pieces that we've incorporated. So 
trying to explain the, the potential for this in a similar map um, and why we've done what we've done. So, so North Glasgow um, is separated from the city centre by the, the motorway, the M8 motorway, which actually, ironically, was built on top of 19 kilometres of the Monklands Canal because it was a, a perfectly free corridor in the 1960s to build a motorway along. Um, so the canal actually, parts of the canal run through pipes uh, alongside and under the motorway to, to supply the water into the canal network. Um, as part of that separation and, and you know the industrial change and the, the land use change, North Glasgow itself um, has become an area that is needing to be redeveloped, regenerated, uh, and, and enhanced. Um, there are populations, or certainly when we started this project, there are people living in areas on this plan um, where the male mortality rate is 54. So life expectancy of this population is has really really struggled so it, it's one of it it was um uh, areas of it still will be but it's changing rapidly now um parts of you know europe's most deprived areas um and and this project has been a contribution to that that, that significant change um so you know that's the why the, the why is not just about you know flooding and other bits and pieces it's about redeve redevelopment regeneration and actually creating a, a much more sustainable community and and improving people's lives and their life expectancy and their health um, and other other aspects on this plan we've got um four development areas highlighted in red um, they're four of five that we've identified at this time and that are going to connect into the canal they exist in a catchment that is constrained from a surface water management perspective the the the, the nearest uh, water course used to run across the top of this plan, um, which would be the, the, the Possel Burn. It's now part of the combined sewer network. Um, there's lots of combined drainage. There's no nearby water course. The River Kelvin is just running down the left of here, and the River Clyde is running to the south, both being about two kilometers away from the, from the site. Um, there's no easy connection. However, the canal you can see running through into this area. And that was part of what we looked at was how do we enable development regeneration to take place without placing a further burden on a combined drainage system um, and that's where we, we looked at the canal um, the area highlighted in green is actually a nature reserve that we've we've been able to build as part of a, another wider project um, and our office is just on the south of that and some days we're lucky enough to look out of our window and there are, there's a there are deer there are cormorant there are herons um, and, and literally this is a 10 minute walk from a city center it's absolutely phenomenal in terms of the, the opportunity and the place and, and the space that it provides. Um, the four different sites on here, so um, Hamilton Hill, they're all hills. Uh, well, how cow lairs, which is where the cows were. The, the smaller one in the middle is Dundas Hill, where the distillery was. And then we've got Site Hill on the right, which uh, has been key. It, it, Glasgow City Council, and that's been one of the key enablers. It was put forward as a transformational regeneration area. Um, it was put forward for the Youth Olympic Games of 2018 which unfortunately went off down to uh, South America um, and then we've got this nice green arrow on the bottom where we're actually building a garden bridge at this moment in time Glasgow City Council are building a garden bridge over the motorway so for those of you who might be in London and you haven't got your garden bridge over the Thames do feel free to come up to Glasgow and see our garden bridge you're more than welcome and I'm quite happy to take you on a little bit of a tour around North Glasgow if you wished um, so again why have we done this so so there, there's clearly a need for development regeneration um, we've got to provide a means of uh, removing surface water and one of one of the key driving principles of the metropolitan glasgow strategic drainage partnership is keeping surface water on the surface so avoid the pipes um again adapting to climate change so this concept is nine years old now but it's got everything that we kind of embody in our thinking of you know 2021 and, and thinking you know is changing it is evolving and Peter and I were discussing earlier, it's getting quite exciting, the momentum that is building in this space. Um, and, and it's great that we've been able to do this and deliver it. Um, key aspect is reducing the uncertainty for development. Developers want to be able to develop and, and be driven and, and guided, but they need support as well, especially when you're looking at coming into areas that are contaminated or have this industrial legacy in it. So, so this scheme gave developers confidence to come in and commit to, to building. Um, and then a key one for Scottish canals is, is diversifying the canals in the 21st century. They were they were built 200 years ago to, you know, the, the boats and the footfall would have been enormous. You know, there are there are some very nice buildings along the canal where, where you know, the tolls were paid, which paid for the maintenance of the canals. Now, the canals have gone through decline and renaissance and, and whole cycles, but they still have to fit and have a purpose in the 21st century to justify their existence. Um, 
we've got lots of benefits from them, the, the, you know, the visitors and the health benefits and everything else, and we do that, but actually it's really nice to get a good functional benefit out of them as well. Um, and there are some links in here, and there's some good videos, bits and pieces about them. Um, so what we did as part of this is, is when, we, when we started looking at the, the, the project, um, we turned it on its head. So the canal networks historically would be fed by water from reservoirs, and the water would just be allowed to, to flow through the canal. Um, they would they would self-regulate through the waste weirs. Everything would be nicely balanced. Um, they're, they're driven for the need of maintaining water and keeping it in, so that the canals provide a depth of water for boats to travel on. And that's that's just a business as usual and uh, as being normal. So um, we turned this on its head with a view of being able to have a system that would be more controllable and adaptable and regulated, and that's through the through a data-driven process, and put water in when it's needed rather than put water in and have it wasted. So actually that allows us to save our resource. Um, and then again, we looked at it and said, well, how do we create space? So it, you know, extreme rainfall, climate change, wh what happens in, in, in those significant rainfall events? Um, and you know, I, the sponge city concept, for those of you aware of that, you know, being able to create the pores within the city to absorb water. Um, so we started looking at the canal and, and saying, well, can we do something with the canal? Can we utilize it as a means of, as a drainage route or a conveyance route and allow the water and use it to get out, which means that we can get, get that water away from the combined system um, or, or alternatively not look at trying to put in new big bits of infrastructure to drain it to, to rivers, et cetera. Um, so we did, we did that and we looked at alternatives. So rather than draining it through a tunnel to the, the water course, well, let's use the canal and we did some cost exercise and when you start looking at it, actually the numbers become quite considerable and the benefits have been quite unique um and then this little piece about using the using the summit town so that that sponge city concept the poor in the city was that we we basically what what we have done is we've enabled ourselves to reduce the water level in the summit pound by 100 millimeters which the, the canal is is typically um 1.8 to 2 meters deep so we're, we're taking 5% of the volume of the, the canal out, um, and that creates 55,000 cubic meters of storage volume, which is quite significant. You know? and, and if you looked at putting that in, in, in you know, drainage systems or, or you know, underground storage and other bits and pieces, you know, you're talking about 14, we estimate 14 million pounds of quite efficient on-site delivery. So that's, that's a, another saving to be had, which, which adds up. Um, the, the, the bit about that is trying to get the balance between navigation and, and, and extreme rainfall and lowering the canal and raising the canal and what do we do with it. So that was, that was all part of this process. So I'm going to try and explain this with a few hopefully fairly simplistic but a bit more technically minded slides. So a little bit around the canal infrastructure. So you can see Glasgow, um, the piece of canal coming in down to the right hand side of here is, is the Glasgow branch of the Forth and Clyde Canal. Um, and then it goes off and it goes up to the reservoirs and, and becomes part of the, the Mugley Canal, which is the kind of dotted bit because some of it's in pipes. Um, we've got the, the canal going across the top from west to east, um, and then it's got in here the summit pound. So um, I'm going to try and use my pointer and hopefully this will work. So uh, Glasgow, the red dot is where the development's taking place. We've got lock 21, which is the lock that's at the top of the summit pound to the west. We've got lock 20, which is the lock at the top, the top of the summit pound to the east. So this is the 19 kilometers of summit pound flowing through here and it comes into glasgow um these are all the all the monitoring and the, the data collection uh, locations that we've incorporated so we've got a lot of monitoring stations for flows uh, water level um, and we've got water quality monitoring stations that we've incorporated um, and we've got controls at um, discharges that come out of the canal so we've, we've incorporated three locations where we actively take the water out the canal when we need to um, and we've got feeders that come in. So there's one that comes in at the top. Actually, the next slide will do it. There's one that comes in at the top, which comes from the reservoir. And this is this bit about, I talk about the ability of draining water around the country by gravity. Um, and we've got a feeder from other reservoirs, um, which come in here, and we put controls on those feeders. So we can turn the water off and stop it coming in the canal. We can turn, uh, we can actuate and change the sluices on and take the water out of the canal. And then we can monitor it all over the place. So um, we've got a dashboard that um, quite often I, in a geeky way, I quite like logging in and having a little look about and seeing what's going on. Um, and that will then is part of the brain. And I'll, give you, I'll show you some screenshots of that. So if you imagine that's the infrastructure that we've built, 
And let's imagine that um, let's imagine it's just going to be another one of those wet July days. So day one, um, effectively, we take Met Office data. It's coming through into the integrated catchment model. Thank you very much, Innovise. Thank you very much, Met Office, for providing us the stuff that we need. It's running through and processing it in the same that you would do with flood forecasting uh, technology. Uh, thank you very much to, to SEPA for providing some of the insight into how this was all developing 10 years ago because the flood forecasting technology has improved massively. Um, and it goes through and it runs through a series of algorithms of is that weather significant, extreme or not? Um, and then, and then it, you know, the rain will fall on the development and the rain's coming through the, the, the sub sustainable drainage systems and coming into the canal. Now, the canal can absorb some of it. Um, it could be that we could turn off the feeders and we can absorb a little bit more. It could be that it's really extreme and then we have to go into the, the dynamic approach. And if we go into the dynamic approach, effectively, this is where the, the water will leave the canal and it will lower itself down. Um, and it, effectively, the timing of that is, is, is 24 hours before the rainfall would hit. So effectively, we, the water leaves the canal and it goes off into the River Kelvin. So it goes into the water environment and it leaves the system 24 hours before the rain hits. Um, then obviously, we've lowered the water level and it's down um, and we've got everything in place. We've got the two locks that will carry on operating to feed water e uh, east and west because obviously we've got boats moving about and we need to make sure that they don't get stuck. Um, then basically, it would start to rain. Uh, the water would come in to back into the canal um, and start to fill it up and then it will um, return itself back. Um, it's quite funny, but for those of you who remember um, probably many years ago, John Prescott walking around in his wellies, uh, you know, in response to flooding going, this must never happen again. And we had the DEFRA making space for water agenda. This is making space for water. We are emptying the water out, putting it into the water environment in a, con in a controlled, low risk manner and creating a giant pour. So we've taken making space for water and sponge cities and just done it on a giant scale. And it's really I'm really pleased to see that there's now lots of people developing technologies into smaller scale sponge pours, you know, at a house scale and, and driving the same technological approach so that we, you keep it as a resource for when you need it, you only get rid of it when you know it's going to get replaced, um, and then you create that space, which means you can absorb, uh, and that's going to have huge impacts in terms of the benefits of having a resource when you want the resource and also having capacity to soak up when we need to have that capacity. But we've done it. We've done it. So, so that's the kind of technical pieces to it. Um, a little bit around the, the, the brain behind it and tying it together. So um, we've got um, the, the new developments and the roads coming in through SUDS. So we've incorporated SUDS and we've got attenuation and treatment coming in and they discharge into the canal. One of the, one of the key opportunities that the project and the canals uh, enable us to have is that the canals are a that they are a regulated water body, but not to the same constraint as a water environment. So what comes into the canals is not regulated as such, but what goes out of the canals is regulated. However, the canals, we do, you know, we do look after them. They're a scheduled monument. Um, they're used for paddling and, and they're, they're a recreational water body. Um, so what we've incorporated is being able to monitor the flows, the levels uh, and the water quality. So we measure the water quality of what's coming in. So we will have huge data sets on the performance of studs. Um, as they all come online, we'll be able to clearly demonstrate whether they work or whether we're over designing them or under designing them. And effectively, we are now going to regulate the water that's coming into the canal. Um, and there's, you know, we, 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 good conversations with Scottish Water and, and Glasgow City Council about how we manage that process. Um, so that, that comes in. Um, we've obviously then got these discharges that have taken the water out of the canal, which go out into the natural water environment. All of this is monitored and brought through into a control room. Uh, where it's then done in an autonomous way. So um, effectively, the, the system will run itself autonomously. Um, if it wants to do anything, um, at the moment it's kind of operating in a semi-autonomous way. Um, if it wants to do anything, it would ask us if, it, if it's able or if it's allowed to do it. So it's a bit like having a, a hormonal teenager asking for permission to go and, and go, go out and do something. It's like, yes, you can or no, you can't. There's a few of us who keep an eye on it. At some point, it's going to grow up. Um, and we're going to let it go and do its own thing, and it will be able to say, I'm doing this, and, and it will inform us, and we'll be able to monitor it, and then it will evolve. And actually what's been exciting is, and there is an opportunity, and so people keep talking about it, and find the time to do it, is putting artificial intelligence on, on this system and enabling it to go through its teenage years on its own and then you know grow up maybe a little bit quicker. 
Um, and there, there is an exciting opportunity in there. Um, again, through the process of the, of the project, we, um, well, I, I tore up the rule book and I changed the terminology, uh, and there was a reason for that. Um, so within the development areas, we went through and we developed um, water management areas. And there was a reason for this, and this was driven probably by the, the WSUD approach at the time. I didn't want to refer to subcatchments, and I didn't want to refer to drainage areas, because that implies that water is a waste and surface water is a waste. So we created water management areas trying to think, actually, surface water is a resource. We should manage it as such. So water management areas, not, not catchments and an and aspect of that. We then created dynamic water management systems, um, which have water management elements in them. And everybody thought it was absolutely bonkers. Um, and actually, some of it is, is it's not as bonkers as you, as you think. It, it actually, you can see the benefits in it at times. We changed the terminology because if you use some terminology, you get wrapped up in regulation. So there are parts of the developments that don't have swales because swales are written into rule books and have to be of a certain shape, a certain size, and managed by certain organizations. So we have water management elements. In fact, we have what is called, in one of the developments, the Northern Conveyance Route just because it doesn't comply with any rules. And actually, we've, we've managed to agree that we're going to have it. it. It could have been a swale, but it would have required to be mown grass off certain side slopes with an access road through a nature reserve. Didn't want to do that. It's a conveyance route, which is basically going to have minimal maintenance. It's just going to be a natural you know, channel to get water. And it's now a water management element. So by not referring to standard uh, design aspects means that you don't have to adopt the standards that that, that tie you up um, and I'm, I'm pleased that we managed to do some of that um, and again we, we developed this that the, the, the dynamic systems would would hold water under nor, normal conditions um, there's an element here of and we've incorporated one so dynamic being that we would hold water in the developments the same as we do in the canal but we would let it out in advance of rainfall so um, I remember, I remember referring to muddy suds should be no more, i.e. we should be able to take that water, incorporate it into a development, create that better design option, and know that we can create the space for the water when we need it, but hold the water when we don't. Um, and then we have non-dynamic. So there's, there's an, an element of dynamic and non-dynamic. The dynamic water management systems in developments have been really difficult to be able to get over the line. So we have one, or we will have one. I'm hoping that it's a start and people will see that actually we can build on it and the technology does work. So we have a, we will have a, we have a suds channel, very urban, it's got concrete in it, which hopefully will be planted up with floating ecosystems, with people's properties really close up. We've had discussions about building right up to the front, almost continental style. Um, we've had to, we've had to come back from that and, and there's been, there's been opportunities that we've not been, been able to take forward um, and there's been opportunities that we have um, and maybe we'll, we'll get onto some of that in the discussion. Um, so there's a little bit of you know the concept of the scheme. This is the footprint of everything that's that's on there, but actually this is this is a map that's got you know so many different ordnance survey layers on it. The key part of it, actually that's the infrastructure that's really important. It doesn't matter about the roads, it doesn't matter about the buildings. And this was a this was a suggestion in the concept back in 2013. And I I've always got a wry smile on my face about this because actually we can see this getting built on site. Um, it's not complicated. Water flows down hills. So you just have to look at the top topography and go, well, the water's going to find its own way. So you may as well put your systems in along those contours. Um, and, and, and this is the infrastructure. It's, some of it's not exactly where it was kind of put into this concept. But overall, this is what we're starting to see that's going to get built. So we are seeing this, and, and we are having still some challenging conversation. I'm going to leave this this presentation, go off to a meeting to talk about Hamilton Hill and the development that's sitting within that, uh, the, the proposal that are going to sit within that development. Um, the concept, we talked about launching and putting sensors left, right, and center, um, and measuring and monitoring everything, and then we could really do it. Um, our concept was really, really high. There's some days I get a little bit frustrated because I think we've delivered probably 40% of the concept. There are some days I feel really positive because I think we've delivered 40% of the concept. Um, but, you know, 40% of something is better than nothing of everything. So I just have to keep reminding myself. But I do hope that people can take this away and go, actually, we can build on it. We can build on it. The technology's there. The systems. Is, is this a place that people can come and realize that actually this is the start of something that can go elsewhere? Likewise, everybody's welcome to come along. So 
a little bit um, around this is we set some thresholds, water quantity thresholds, return periods. We don't like to refer to return periods, you know, percentage of annual probability, bits and pieces. And we, we worked through that so that the water quantity, effectively, the system should not be dynamic at a 30-year return period. It will absorb and it will flow because we've got suds and other bits and pieces in, and that's kind of a business as usual. Um, we have limited flows into the canal, and we've, we've asked for attenuation back to greenfield runoff rates. I actually think that we can probably do more on that. Um, having a non-dynamic operation means that the canal navigation isn't interrupted. So it means that our boaters can go out in a 30-year return period event. Oh, crikey, good luck to them if they want to. It's probably not the best weather. But, but it means that they can do that because we do have a statutory duty for navigation. Um, after that, if we're going to lower the canal, um, effectively we'll go out and tell everybody that the canal is going to go down. Um, it's not it's not that significant, um, but it does mean that, you know, if, if the event is more than a 30 year, so if it's a 200 year return period event, um, I would hope the voters aren't wanting to go out. Um, you know, it's going to be a pretty grim Scottish day. Um, however, you know, there, there may be an impact on navigation and, and we will set that up in terms of an alert and communication. And again, we can tell people saying, you know, you might find that you can't go somewhere. You know, 100 millimetres, again, there are points in our canal where the, the depth is very, very um, shallow. Dynamic, so again, anything over that, it'll go into this dynamic um, uh, operational mode where we will implement it. And, and actually, will it be 100 millimetres? Well, that's going to go through a whole process of learning. Does it need to be 100 millimetres for a 70-year event? No, it doesn't. It, it, it will self-learn, and we will go through calibrating it um, as, as time goes on, and actually as the development comes on, because the development is going to take probably 20 years, 25 years probably to be fully realised. Um, a little bit going back through the journey of the project, um, it entered what I called wilderness years in about 2014, uh, 2015, 2016. Um, but actually, we were really lucky that um, the, the crew, so the Centre of Expertise for Waters, uh, funded by the Scottish Government, did a review of the system. So they kind of looked at a full review of the project, um, and it was really, really positive. They said, look, this is, this is definitely something we should be trying to, trying to achieve. It, 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 does everything everybody wants to do in surface water management. Um, and that was great because it gave the project another bit of in impetus. It was, it was a, an independent review that said, you know, yep, you all get all these organizations working together. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it came out and said, you know, you should just get into the point of having an agreement and making sure it can go forward. Um, it did go through and identify a variety of risks, not necessarily technic technical, but more around governance and, and risk management. Um, and then it was about how do you get a handle on the costs and ownership and, and all of that, those aspects. So that kind of led on to the next piece of work that we did. Um, and again, an output of it is, is the project has got just huge numbers of benefits. So um, the byproduct of development, surface water runoff, you know, it recognizes it being a resource, not just the byproduct that we need to put down a drain and get rid of and get sent out to sea. Um, the design opportunities are huge, and, and we're, we are really starting to see some of those come through. It's still challenging about trying to land them, but, but we will get there. Um, creating a destination for international water managers. I you know I've never actually made it to Malmo. I know everybody keeps going to Malmo or Oregon or anywhere else. I want people to come to Glasgow. Um, this is where we want people to come. Um, and again, this other bit about saving space. So you know that 55,000 cubic meters of water that's in the canal, of which you would expect to be incorporated within a development, that's space that could be turned into development because we're moving the burden of mitigating the development and putting it into the canal rather than in the, keeping it in the development. So saving space and, 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 and creating more value. Um, we went through a whole process of trying to reach the agreement and in 2018, we signed a document, we signed a drainage partnership agreement um, between Scottish Water, Glasgow City Council and Scottish Canals, and, and we've built on that and we continue to work um, and, and we've reached this agreement about who does what. Um, we operate the canal, we operate the smart aspect of it, um, it's the canal the, the canal elements, and, and we will operate some of the monitoring and bits and pieces within the developments. The developments are coming through, proposing non-standard type subs, and we're working through that um, constantly with Scottish Water and the developers to make sure that we're seeing things that are different, um, and we will enter into development with uh, into agreement with developers to take the water into the canal and they will enter into an agreement with um, with Scottish Water, their, their infrastructure, which allows developers to build houses and, and move on, which is what they want to do. Um, a little bit of into in some aspects of inter delivery. This is this is the developments that are taking place. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna flip through some slides and, and give you some short maybe videos, but uh, there, there's a you know little bit here of a video of the development around Site Hill, which actually 
because I've not been allowed to get out of the house much over the last 12 months like everybody else sitting at home. Um, you know, th this is it taking place. You can see it. It is being built. We are seeing the ponds. My wry smile about where the, um, you know, where the water goes. You know, these ponds are being built in locations that we did sketch on those plans as a suggestion. But that's because, as I said, water just goes down downhill. It, you, you know, it's not rocket science trying to figure out where water is going to go. Um, you just have to look at some topography. But we've got this being built. We've got development taking place. Um, to be honest, if I went and had a look at this now, there are houses all over these hills being built. It, it, the pace of it is incredible. Um, and people are starting to move into these homes. And, and there's a lot of park. There's a lot of open space, green space, um, you know, connectivity. The whole aspect of 20-minute communities that, that came about of last year is being realized um, here. Again, a bridge over the motorway, the connection to the city. So there's 3,500 new homes going to be built on the five areas that are associated with those that are draining to this site. Um, I mean, this is, this is the, the, the land and the contractors working away. You can see the canal just around the corner, um, and it's going to come through. We've got granite suds. We've got granite terraces. We've got um, a nice mixture of urban um, you know, parkland and, and rural mix within the surface water management proposal. It's not just about having a pond with a wall around it and a fence sitting there that's going to be, you know, filled up with water and drained down again. Um, and it, it, it all interrelates within within the corridor and builds on the canal. Um, I'll, I'll flip through some of this. Again, the, this, is, the, this is some aspects of the nature reserve that we've built. So, you know, the, the canal and boardwalks and people living, you know, with the city as, as the backdrop. Um, this is a lot of it. This is this is the dashboard that, that I can log into and have a look at. So um, uh, the, the the kind of geography, slightly different geographical map. Um, this is it's a very strange schematic. This is the the Glasgow branch of the canal, and then this is the Summit Pound. Um, and on here we've got level, flow, actuators, water quality, and I can drill into this and have a little look about at the data. Um, you know. If it's wanting to do something, it would send me alert saying it's wanting to do it. I can, you know, we can approve it and let it do it. Um, it will just be there monitoring. And with this, as we build it, we'll become more Scotland, Scotland wide. Um, here's a little example. I don't know when I did this. It might be, it might be January. I think I, I took this screenshot. I think it is. So this is one of the water quality monitoring stations where we can measure um, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, temperatures, uh, the water level, um, and the other one's pH. Um, I think I did this in January, which was was quite interesting because I think the temperature was about two degrees in the water, but and, and where the water was, but actually it was when the canals were frozen. There's nothing worse than in January getting a photograph where you see people's footprints on top of a canal. You don't want to see that. It's really quite worrying. But you know, we, we were able to monitor it um, and, and go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, the canal is the that canal's closed. Uh, uh, it will be frozen. Um, and there's a whole load of information that comes through from the, the system, the SCADA, the battery health, everything that is sitting in this place. I mean, it's being monitored, um, and, and, and we can use that for lots, of, lots, lots of information. Um, and I think we're probably only scratching the surface of what we can do with this with, with canal with the canals in the, in the future. Yeah, that's the, that's the temperature graph that we had in January, where it basically was what, below three degrees and up, up above four. Um, back in 2012, I remember doing this, this. This was actually a slide, and I had to put 2012 on it. So in, in 2012, I wrote a slide saying, "How would I define success of this project?" So. By 2017, we'd have visitors from Malmo and elsewhere to come and see our water. It's a bit of ironic. Um, the infrastructure in the site hill would have been in place um, and a legacy from the bid for the Youth Olympic Games. And we'd be able to demonstrate the approach is cost effective. Um, you know, being able to then help other people take that next step, more development, um, develop skills, develop this way of thinking. Um, I did a lot of reflection in 2018. I updated it. And said, well, by 2020, North Glasgow would have visitors from Malmo, Sweden, Northwest. And that was it. it. It was just a change in time. And maybe my ambition was too high. Maybe I thought we could do this a lot quicker. This was a highlight for me last year. Um, this film crew came to visit us from Estonia. One of the few days I got out the, got out the house in 20, uh, 2020, I went and met them in Glasgow. And I took them around the canal and they interviewed me. And actually, this was this, this photo I took of them. This gentleman on the left is repeating to his film crew, well, I think he's repeating to it, the film crew, everything I'd said to him over about an hour and a half, but he said it all in Estonian, and I haven't a clue what he said, so I'm only hoping he got it right. But we've had visitors from Estonia, we've had 
Unfortunately, when visitors from Holland had to cancel their visit because of COVID, we've had people in Australia taking note and getting in touch saying that's really interesting. We've had lots of interest. So, you know, it's really positive to see that people are, are realizing that we have done something a little bit different. Um, so, you know, we've done that. Again, this year, sitting here and thinking, well, actually, how do we define success? And I, we did a little bit of um, review and consideration of it. And, you know, Going back, if we were going to go and take a traditional approach to surface water management of these developments, we've pretty much saved 75% of the cost by reusing and repurposing the canal network. So it was built for us. It has an embedded value, and now we're just being able to realize that in a different way. Um, 5,000 tons carbon equivalent saved, capital carbon. So, you know, we have a net zero agenda. Everybody's championing about how do we do it. Um, and, and 500 tons of carbon equivalent operational savings per year by taking the water and putting it through the canal rather than sending it down through a combined sewer network. So we've got a 60-year agreement in place. So effectively, there's 35,000 tons of carbon saved. Um, and again, we're realizing it. And it, it's a little bit about, you know, what's the lowest carbon option for anything? Most of the time, it's the one that's already built. And we need to be thinking about that. You know we have to repurpose the infrastructure that we have if if we as society are going to get to being net zero by whether it's 2045 if you're in scotland or 2050 if you're in the uk or or all of these targets that are being set we really do have to start evaluating it this has taken 10 years to realize this the carbon saving was not a driver in the project it is just uh, an incidental, it's just a coincidence, an unintended consequence of the project is that we have saved 35,000 tons of carbon. I worked it out, that's the equivalent of 83 million miles in a vehicle saved by doing this project. So we've just got to go out and look for it. And a little bit next steps, building on it. So we carried on, we've built, we've put some of these in, floating ecosystems. That's Galen, Galen Fulford at the bottom left who helped in the, origina in the development of the original concept. Really exciting uh, time when we worked on that. We have had we had the criminal prosecution service come along with their corporate social responsibility days and help us build these things and float them in the canal. Great, they're, they're sitting in there. We're, we're building these aren't actually ours. They're, they're elsewhere, and, and I haven't been able to go out and take photographs of them. I've got some aerial footage of them. Again, building that, and that's from a water quality, habitat, aesthetic perspective within the development that we're building. So, just just briefly to touch upon, what next? So. Who are Scottish canals in the 21st century? Very interesting question that we have to keep asking ourselves. Um, you know, we operate the Falkirk wheel, we do all sorts of bits and pieces. We are helping and work develop on climate change adaptation um, aspects, and, and the project has been a key part of that, and a lot of our process is around that. Um, we will carry on doing that, and, and we'll keep trying to evolve and innovate in a different way. Um, Again, what do the canals do in flooding? Unfortunately, the, that aerial photograph was August the 12th last year for us. Bit of a bit of a shocker of a day. Uh, waking up in the morning to find that the canals were broken due to a 240-year return period event and some failed drainage infrastructure, which broke our canal. Um, our canal did not fail; it broke. Uh, it was broken by external um, factors. Uh, it took away the Glasgow Edinburgh Railway line. As a result, for six weeks, the impacts of climate change on our existing and historic and future infrastructure is going to be huge. But actually, our existing infrastructure and repurposing it and thinking differently allows us to do stuff in a different way. So we are going to carry on doing that. Um, and quite quite pleasingly, it's been bolted into our corporate strategy. So we, we continue to look at what canals can do. So we've got 19 reservoirs. We've got 140 miles of channels. We've got the feeders. We actually are working in a space that we can do other bits and pieces. I can't remember what the next one is. Oh yeah, so this was quite funny. I think we're doing the putting this together. You know, again, can we take the technology and can we export it and use it in different places? You know, tech, it's it's not complicated. It's about risk management. It's about using the data. So so the smart canal. People say it's amazing. Well, actually, for those people who are technically minded, will look at what I've talked about and gone, it's not that complicated. It's just gluing it all together in a slightly different way. Um, and then how can we take it and, and apply it in different places? Because because we, we, we can demonstrate now that, that it works. Um, and that's me. Brilliant. Peter, I, I could listen to this all day long. I was absolutely in, totally engrossed from start to finish there. And, and I really like to thank you. I mean, 
what, what a fantastic achievement. And uh, I mean, the, the, my brain was going in overtime there because uh, my hometown, Swindon, they, they, they built the city centre or the town centre over the canal. They, they, they just literally filled it full of rubbish and you've done the complete opposite. So the vision to, to, to utilize an existing um, canal system and use it as, a, as an asset for all those multiple benefits is just such a credit and a fantastic legacy. So uh, I wish everyone would be doing it across the whole country, which leads me to the question. So th thank you. Uh -huh. um, it, <laughs> super. Um, so uh, it, for Islam in, in Pakistan, yeah, we're definitely going to share the presentation, the slides, etc. So we have visitors on online from Pakistan here who are really uh, riveted as well. Um, Elaine, um, is there, uh, Peter, is there any, Peter one, is there any interest in expanding the idea to English and Welsh canals? So, um, yes, yes, we've, um, uh, about, uh, crikey, six weeks ago, um, it was really pleasing that we could, uh, we did, I did a similar presentation with the Environment Agency, who were very keen, so there's a little bit of and, and we work quite closely with our, our cousins in the Canal and Rivers Trust, as we refer to them. Um, the, I suppose th this project has been realized through a perfect storm of opportunity of the development, the regeneration and, and everything, and even just the physical nature of everything being in the right place. But now that we've been able to do it, we can expand upon it. So we're, we're sharing it with as many people um, as possible. And I think, you know, everybody who's been involved in it would like to see it replicated. Um, and it just depends on the location and the scale. So um, fingers crossed, yes, you might have a smart canal near you soon. Brilliant, yeah. And, and where the office is, the, uh, the, the ex-micro drainage and Innovise office in Newbury, we're right alongside the canal, um, the, the Kennington Avon Canal. Um, so I can sort of see possibilities, possibilities there. That, that's actually nicely done. They've, um, they've redeveloped alongside the canal and there's lots of kind of pubs and restaurants and offices that overlook the canal so yeah. there could be converted warehouses and all that old industrial heritage they've kind of converted it and sort of turned it around 180 degrees so you you benefit yeah. from being alongside the water and you mentioned earlier on to me peter that is, is there some sort of social studies on health to say about health yeah. benefits yeah, and, and well, it's absolutely. Thank you, Peter. It's, you, you've opened the door, lovely for me. Um, we we had some research done and published um, last July, um, which was carried out by Glasgow Caledonian University. So, the, the this aspect I was referring to about the the decline and the renaissance of canals. Um, so, for us in Scotland, we had uh, a lot of investment took place in 2000, 2001 when the Millennium Link was built, and the the, the Forth and Clyde Canal had been disrupted and and was, you know, it, the quality and, and the nature of it was just shocking and, and lottery funding enabled it to be reopened and, and created it as a new navigation. Um, last last year, uh, research was done looking at the investment that took place just in, in the piece of the Glasgow branch that we've been referring to in reopening it and making it, you know, accessible to the public. You know, we have those 20 million visitors I refer to, 99.5% of them are visiting the towpaths or paddling. So we refer to our, our boaters, our booters and our bikers coming along and using this for, you know, access safe routes. Um, we're really fortunate we've had Sustrans have, have helped fund the corridor for towpaths for improvement of, of um, active travel. And as part of that research, they went through and they looked through mortality rates over that 20 year period of time and have identified that the people who live within 500 meters of the canal now live long or their, their, their life expectancy has increased more than the people who live more than 500 meters away from the canal so that the canal is clearly if you're within 500 meters of the canal you're probably thinking well i'll 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 take my bike and i'll go along the canal and i'll i'll use that for my active travel and they are now benefiting or having health benefits so you know that we were referring earlier our, our gut feeling is that the blue green infrastructure is really really important um and and it's just a question of there's a benefit to society. How can you sustain it? So it's really good for us because we can justify the purpose of a canal network in the 21st century from a health perspective. Um, so it, it's uh, just another add-on to, to the value, the added value that we get. Mm. And, and I, I, I love that sort of 35,000 tons of, of carbon as well. That That's brilliant. I mean, to you're taking that water out of the wastewater system, out of the combined sewers. It doesn't have to go through pumping stations yeah. and treatment works, et cetera, et cetera. This is the thinking that we really, 
I, I, I just I want to, I want everyone on the planet involved in our industry to sort of take these things on board. I'm just going to look at the at the questions here, Peter, because they're flying in thick and fast. Um, does the water does the canal take surface water from the entire city of Glasgow? Asked Jacob. So, so no, it's at the moment it's just these five key areas that we've looked at. Um, the opportunity is bigger. So, so we, you know, we're going to start off with with what we've made a commitment to do. I suspect that over time, as more development regeneration comes along, then the opportunity to drain more in within. And again, it, it has to be um, uphill. Um, absolutely refuse to pump any water because you can't do that with without any carbon input, or well, unless so, somebody comes so. up with making sure that we're using the right energy sources. Um, so we've started off with this. Um, that's the, the modelling that we've, that's been done is that that can be accommodated, and that's within the, the concept and, the, and oh, sorry, within the the range of what we've delivered. Um, part of me thinks that as we go through this and it learns and it evolves and it adapts, we will then be able to identify how to sweat it properly. So it, mm. it's it's relatively conservative at the moment, and then we can we can sweat it over time. Mm. We'd love to see like arteries coming off of this main artery, if you know what I mean. So these like bl blue green corridors emanating out and sort of yeah. feeding into the the city. Um, it's quite. I, I refer to it as being a kind of, kind of anatomical. It's like the, you know the canal is the spine of the system. Um, mm. We've got the we've got the limbs coming up into the developments, and then we get the fingers going on. And then basically what we've done is just put a big brain on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's a good one. Um, this is a really interesting one from Rodolfo. Um, what range of speeds can water reach the canals? So is there a, you've got connections coming into the canal. Are you limiting the velocity of the flow coming in? Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have a standard limitation that we don't let water come into the canal at more than one meter per second. Yeah. Um, and, and actually one of the, one of the key aspects that was considered in, uh, the the abstraction locations and taking the water out of the canal is to make sure that we minimise the velocity along the canal. So it's it's there's an element of that and there's a legacy around that. So we, we we've we've aimed to limit flows through the canal below 0 0.1 meters per second, and that's because of the historic and industrial use of the canal is actually the material in the canal is not necessarily clean, and we we don't want to stir it up. So so there are there's been a lot of environmental considerations in setting the parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens to this? It's just out of, out of interest, like the sediment that's in the canals has built up over like two hundred odd years. Is, is there any kind of dredging that goes on, or is it just left so, to settle? Um, no, so so we we do we do do dredging, um, and we're li literally this winter on the Union Canal, we've just done a, a quite a significant channel clearance process. Um, it, it's incredibly complicated and it's quite expensive because you know we've got parts of the canal that. You know, if you if you take a historic map of Scotland and look at what the canals were used for, it's quite worrying in certain places. You know, we do have areas where we have maybe high levels of mercury and other bits and pieces. So every every location that we do any part of dredging, we have to go through and test it and assess it and determine whether it's hazardous material or not. Um, and if it is hazardous, removing it is an incredibly expensive process. So we we prefer just to leave it where it is. Yeah, make make makes sense. Um, one from Steve. Um, it's a, this is a very old and significant asset with the potential for loss of life through failure. Um, so how, how to assess the condition of the asset uh, to make sure it was it's like eight point one fit for its original purpose and two for it for its new more dynamic purpose? Yeah, uh, great qu great question. So. Um... You're going to give me another sleepless night by making me worry about my job. Um, no. So we, we, we have we have 4,100 assets across Scotland, um, range of ages. Um, that's part of our job. We have we have a range of people going out inspecting them. We've got a, you know we've got an asset inspection procedure document. If you wanted to read 110 pages long, setting out how we measure all of our assets, how we classify them, how we prioritise the work that we do. Um, one of the key things that we did with this project, so when we originally started with the concept, we actually looked at trying to see if we could put more water in the canal and, and squeeze it through, which then lead, 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 raises the water level and actually increases the risk. And that was actually one of the key drives of switching it on its head, of going, why don't we, instead of putting the water in and squeezing it through, why don't we take the water out in, in advance? So, the pressure so, sort of yeah. so, so effectively, it takes, so, it's a, it, so the, the way that we've gone about it is the least risk option. And then I suppose the bit about being conservative in terms of what we've done from attenuation and, and flows coming in, uh, and why I believe that we'll be able to sweat the system more in the future, because we have set it up in a very conservative manner. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Well, th thanks, Peter. I've got comments in here. Fantastic presentation. Inspirational. 
brilliant talk thank you very much etc we'll share all these with you but i'll have to thank hand you. over to Ben. i would love to carry this on i've got another meeting that's just about yeah. starting and i know that you're being whisked off yourself so thank you so much and i'll hand hand over back to ben thank you peter yeah you're welcome yeah absolutely brilliant um and as many as your comments reflect that was an inspirational presentation so many thanks to our special guest peter robinson and your host peter coombs today for an excellent webinar if we didn't get a chance to answer your question we'll go back to you with an answer um, our next webinar is next thursday at 1 p.m we'll be welcoming uh, as our special guest andres gonzalez inguez water engineer and phd D student at Leuven University as he shares his research on urban flood modeling and sensitivity analysis. I have shared the join links for that webinar in the GoToWebinar chat and we'll be sharing this link again with you as well as a web as well as well as a recording of this webinar next week. Please also remember to take a minute to complete this short survey that follows this webinar. Your feedback is important to us and in return you'll receive an attendance certificate to use for CPD. These certificates we sent from GoToWebinar in five days' time. Finally, a big thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great day, everyone.